Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL course Rural Water Resource Management, Week Two, Lecture Three. In the previous lecture, we looked upon hydrological parameters number one, which is precipitation, which is the input to the system. In today's lecture, we will look into the evapotranspiration, which is one of the key losses to the system. Please understand when I say loss. It is a water which is taken away from your watershed or unit of analysis. In our unit of analysis, it is the rural watershed or a farmland. Okay, so imagine this is your farmland on the bottom, and you have precipitation, which is the incoming water resource, and then transpiration is the water that the plant takes, uses, and then gives it out back to the atmosphere, transpires. So that is transpiration. Evaporation is the loss of water from the surface of the earth, soil, land surface, etc., and open surfaces. So let's look at some fundamentals. Evapotranspiration, in short, it is called ET, is the loss of water from ground to the atmosphere. It is mostly on the ground because plants and open surfaces are on the ground. ET includes two components, very important components. One is your evaporation and then your transpiration. Evaporation is the process where water is lost from open sources. Example, urban land, land and water. Okay, So urban means, for example, your roof. You can uh, have a rainfall on the roof and it can evaporate Okay, when it is hot. Uh, example of an urban setting is also roads. If you go on a highway, you'll see if it is raining, still the road is dry because it evaporates faster. Then you have evaporation from land, as I shown in the image below. You have evaporation happening from the land surface because of the sun. Evaporation doesn't happen much in the night. Okay? So you have mostly happening in the sun, which is a driver of the hydrological cycle. Then you have water evaporating from your water bodies. Example, fresh water, you could see the evaporation arrow going up. And you can see water evaporating from oceans, water is going up. So all this is included in your evaporation term. Transpiration is from living beings. Okay, so it includes all living organisms from which water is transpired. Let's take examples. The biggest transpires are trees because trees take a lot of water and they consume the water and they give it back into the atmosphere, right? Uh, why plants need water is because it is like a medium of transport of nutrients. So there are a lot of nutrients in the soil, water mixes with the nutrients. And since plants cannot readily take the nutrients, what it does is it takes the sol soluble nutrients in the water. So it takes up the water and all the nutrients stay in the plant, whereas the water is left out of the system. So that is transpiration. Then you have water, the same process. Water can uh, be uh, transpired from plants, which is a smaller form of a tree if you want to look at it, the same process. Uh, and other format is humans, for example, is part of a human being. So if you run, all the water or most of the water in your body is transpired as sweat. You could feel sweat coming out. So that is when water in your body is lost to the atmosphere or out of the body. So uh, losing water is by this process is transpiration. So you could see that both evaporation and transpiration is a water loss to the system. Okay, moving on. Let's look at <coughs> The other components from where evaporation and transpiration can happen. Uh, transpiration can happen from living organisms. Here we have soil, soil grass, materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, whereas evaporation can happen from your oceans, lakes, rivers, because even flowing river when it's hot, you could see it coming not only stagnant, but even some evaporation can happen. Limited, but still some can happen. 
uh, and then uh, water which is falling on the rocks, etc., can evaporate. So evaporation is from non-living organisms, whereas transpiration is from living organisms. Why is evaporation estimation important? Evaporation and transpiration, why is it important? It's very important to estimate the loss of water from open surfaces. Let's take one by one. Uh, and in this study, uh, we're looking at why evaporation is very important. Look at the two images that I've taken in a field visit in Maharashtra. You could see that uh, there's a big lake, and then there is um, a field in the first image, a field with water applied. And in the other hand, you have farm ponds where water is being stored in ponds for future use. Okay. Maybe they want to use it in the dry season or after a couple of days after the rainfall has stopped. So in both the cases, water doesn't stay there because it is stagnant. Uh, some water is lost to the groundwater, okay, but most of the water is evaporated. Okay, So that is the biggest loss. So if, if the sun is shining bright and dry and there is less humidity in the air, then evaporation process will take up. So there's a lot of loss from the system because of evaporation. So that is why it is very important to estimate the loss of water from open surfaces. There are some projects in India where they wanted to close the canals on the top. So you have a dam and from the dam water is taken to irrigation plot areas field using channels or canals. Okay, so both if you have a lined, a cemented uh, canal uh, or a channel, then water can flow through. It doesn't go into the groundwater. Fine. But some, what they did is they wanted to arrest the evaporation. So they put solar panels on the top. So they arrested the water from evaporating from the channels and canals. So they understood that water is very important in that area and they could not afford to have any losses. And one of the key losses, as I said, is evaporation. So it is important to estimate because the remaining is the water that can be used by others. As long as the sun is coming up every day, there will be some evaporation. So unless you understand how much evaporation happens, it is hard to quantify what is the water remaining for your agriculture or other uses be it domestic use, etc. And this is very important for rural areas. Because for example, here, um, if you have a farm pond without understanding the evaporation, you put the money and the budget in time in to put these structures, you see these structures to capture water. But if you didn't understand that the evaporation is so high that you will lose the water within a day or two, then the whole point of the farm pond is lost. So that is where we're trying to say it is important to understand evaporation. Transpiration. As I said, transpiration is from living organisms. Why is it important? Directly tied to carbon sequestration by plants. Why would that be? Because plants, when they grow, when they want to grow, they need nutrients. And as I said in the previous slide, nutrients are transported from the soil into the plant biomass using water. So what is a vehicle or a transport mechanism. Think like our body. We have blood flowing in the body. What is the key work of the blood? To take oxygen. Oxygen from one part across the other parts of your body. It's the same thing. Water takes nutrients from the root to the other parts of the plant. Some water is remained in the plant as fruits, some wetness, you know, when you crush a leaf, you have some wetness some fruit juice, et cetera. But most of the water is given off. We don't give the blood off, but that is the closest analogy you could look at. Okay, so water takes is used by the plant to take up nutrients, first soluble nutrients, and then goes up. So if you understand how much transpiration happens, you can understand how much plant growth happens. If you know how much plant growth happens, you could indirectly measure the carbon sequestered by the plants or how much carbon is kept in the plant or trees. So when a plant or a tree grows, let's take a tree for example, the biomass, the wood that increases is a good part of carbon sequestration. The carbon is brought and kept in your 
factory. So it is very important for Indian government uh, and other uh, working on climate change mitigation adaptation to understand how much carbon a country is capturing. And trees are one of the most important and valuable natural resource that can capture carbon very effectively and very cost effectively. Okay. So uh, by the rates of transpiration, we can understand how carbon sequestration happens. We can understand water use. What is used for transpiration is not available for others. As I said, if you have plants and trees growing, uh, the, the water is first taken up by them and only the remaining water is available for the other aspects of the agricultural cycle. Okay. So for example, your groundwater recharge in infiltration, percolation. All this is after the plant has taken up the water. Otherwise, the plant's uh, potential to take up the water is much, much higher. The rate is higher than your infiltration and percolation. In some in some regions, but in some other regions where you have uh, a very slow moving material, then it could be opposite. But most in most regions, your transpiration is uh, the water that is lost from the system. Uh, even though it is a benefit for the plant, it is lost. It is taken up and given out into the atmosphere. So it is very important to understand how much volume we actually transpire. Humans, animals, living organisms transpire very less compared to the water budget or compared to the hydrological cycle parameters. So it's not a big thing to put in, put in an equation in a, in, a, in, a, in a water cycle. So you didn't see a human transpiring in a, in a water cycle because the plants transpire much, much bigger and uh, the domestic transpiration rates are very small compared to that. If you know how much water plants are using, you can better manage the source. Ah, this is the important part of your rural water management course. If you know how much plant transpires and how much the soil underneath it evaporates, then you can have multiple methods, natural and artificial methods, to control the evaporation or to reduce the evaporation and transpiration from your field. If you do so, then you store more, more water in your system. And that is why it is very important to understand how much water the plant is using. And the plant use water is directly related to your transpiration. Okay. So for better managing, now you've come up on the different terms. For managing rural water, you need to know how much water comes in. We got the precipitation. And how much water is lost, which is one of your transpiration or evaporation. And the remaining, the remaining part would go in as use for other resources. So now if I know how much transpiration occurs and how much I get, okay, so for example, I get 100 millimeters of, uh, and if my plants are going to take up 120 millimeters of water, so the 20 millimeters I have to substitute using other resources like groundwater or dam irrigation, etc. It might be expensive. So the measure of transpiration, which you could do before the planting or rainfall, can help you to better manage the resource. Some examples are drip irrigation, wherein instead of applying for the entire plant body and other areas of your field, you apply only directly to the root zone of the plant. For example, you could reduce the evaporation because all the soil is not wet only the soil under the plant is wet and that would reduce your evaporation. Transpiration also can be reduced because you directly apply only a little bit amount of water in known quantities, not too much water. Karif planting in the monsoon, uh, knowing your transpiration rate can help in Karif planting because if you know your rainfall, as I said, 100 millimeters, however, your crop needs 120 millimeters, then you would change your crop or reduce the acres to, to come back to the volume, which is equivalent to your rainfall. So your rainfall volume should be more or less equal to your land crop water demand. Otherwise, you'll have to substitute from some other resource. It is also important for groundwater irrigation because once you know how much water is taken up by the plant, you know how much can be substituted by groundwater. As I said, 
not always rainfall is given in new water. So some of the water you can take from groundwater irrigation. So now we have come across these two important terms, evaporation and transpiration. Let's see how we can measure them. Since it's measured mostly together, okay. So uh, evaporation can be separate, transpiration can be separate. However, in most rural cases where we are doing farm assessments or field assessments, we club it as evapotranspiration. Since it's measuring both together, this is kind of complex. And there are two major types, which is your physical measurements and your empirical models. Let's look at the physical measurements. You can have uh, the FAO prescribed method on the screen. Uh, and you can see that it is basically a big mass, uh, which is being measured before and after applying the water. Okay, I'll show you the cross section so that you could look at it. The first method is lysimeters, meters, uh, another meter is sap flux meters. For the flow of the class, I would explain one method, which is the most accurate, which is the lysimeter. Empirical models are models which are statistically made by relationships with other variables and knowing one variable you can estimate the et okay so knowing a couple of variables you can estimate the et because the et is a function of those variables so some of the models are like penman monteith or penman method the first method was penman method then people worked on it to convert it to penman monteith ton twite method etc we would look into not the equation, but what goes in and out of the pen. And there are very simpler models like uh, KC method. Okay, so I will go into the KC method by a failure. Let's look at the physical measurement, which is your lysimeter. So this is a cross section of the lysimeter. What you see here is a farmland. Okay, so first visual a, a farmland, and you're cutting a cross section in the so you're looking at the side view, not on the top. Your crops growing, and I'm looking in the side. This, so this is your cross section. So what you see is crops growing. So crops growing on the top, and you have two uh, places where you have some micro lysimeters. We can ignore that for now. But it is a piece of land. Can you see this piece of land is first evacuated out, and then a mass balance scale is put in. So a big measuring weight measuring device is put in here so as a weighing facility it's like if you've seen a truck going and standing on a weighing scale truck full of load that's how they estimate how much uh, a load of a truck is so they'll take the truck they stand on the scale they weigh the scale uh, with the truck before or uh, before emptying and then they go after emptying they come back and then they estimate the load okay so it is a large scale land mass which is taken on. Look at it, it's a weight at 15 tons and the area is 1.5 to 2 meters square uh, and then depth at 2.5 meters. So that's 2.5 meters, approximately 15 tons of land is evacuated. You have to be careful, you should not disturb the sample. It's evacuated and then you put the mass balance inside. Once you put your, then you put back the land. So you, this is your land. You take a piece out, you put your scale underneath, your, your scale to measure the weight, then you put back your land. And in the land, you start growing. How do you grow crops? The row crops, you apply water. So when you apply water, the mass would be increased because you're adding weight through water. And the next day, the water would have evaporated or transpired. So the water is lost and your weight would decrease. So now you have a weight of your water, which is being taken up or decreased. And from the weight, you can est estimate the thickness of water that is being taken up. So this is how a lysimeter in the real life looks at. I've taken this picture from the Parbani University in Maharashtra. You see that this is the land uh, piece that was taken out and the mass scale, which is put in. So you have grass growing. It's the same crop on both sides. So when we apply water, the scale, here you could see the scale would accurately measure the land with the water. And the next day I come back and take a measure. All the water has been either evaporated or transpired. 
knowing the soil, I can estimate how much evaporation happens. So most probably you will come back to transpiration. But since ET is one term, it doesn't matter to give it as one term. Moving on, so now we have estimated evapotranspiration. What about the open bodies, water bodies, etc.? There is no crops there. There is no land there. How do you measure transpiration? So transpiration is zero. Okay. So in open water bodies, evapotranspiration is only from evaporation. So we can label it as evaporation. To measure that, IMD has a evaporation pan technique, which is basically a aluminium pan. You could see. There are multiple dimensions for it, which is given in the figure. But most importantly, think about visualize a pan. So this is a pan with water and a scale, a scale to measure the height of the water. So the first day at nine o'clock in the morning, I would measure the water or six o'clock before sunrise or at sunrise, I would measure the water level. And then the next day, I would come back and measure six o'clock or in the evening after the sun has set, I can measure the value. So what has happened in the whole day is when there is no rainfall. And these are done only when there is no rainfall. When there's no rainfall, the water level would decrease because of evaporation from the top. And that decrease is the rate of evaporation per day. So if you're doing it per day analysis per day. Okay. So it is very important to not have data taken on Rain, rainy day. So most probably it is done on uh, a wet, uh, not wet day or dry day when there's no rainfall. So you would estimate your water loss as a thickness, which directly goes into your water budget. So this is a IMD evaporation pan technique. So now we have looked into the uh, major physical methods by measuring evaporation for ev evaporation and transpiration or ET together. Let's look at regions where if you don't have these, how do you estimate? We have empirical models. Empirical models will, are, are developed by the understanding between variables and how ET is a function. Let's take an example. The crop coefficient approach is the simplest and most widely used because it is promoted by the FAO. You could see that the simple equation is ETC, which is evapotranspiration cropped area C is equal to Kc, which is your crop coefficient Kc times ET0. ET0 is the reference ET. So if you have the definitions here, uh, and uh, what is your Kc is, it is a function of your plant. okay, And it is a function of your crop height, albedo, reflectance of the crop soil surface. So it is both the function of the soil and the crop of that particular location, Kc canopy resistance, how much the uh, leaf area uh, resists the water uh, loss and evaporation from soil. All this is a function which is already built and given by FAO. And different KC values are given for different crop types and different regions for equatorial regions, tropical regions, uh, humid, semi-humid, all those things. So if you can go to this website I've given on the bottom, you could easily get KC. And what is ET0? ET0 is a reference crop evapotranspiration for that particular area. So both, if you see, are units of millimeters per day. And if you're going to report it, your hydrological cycle as per day, then the per day unit goes off. It is just millimeters, right? And then your ET0 is a reference crop. Most probably it is grass, alfalfa crop or any other um, reference crop for that particular region. And all the ET value, ET naught values are given in FAO. We use alfalfa crop, okay, for our region also. So ET naught would be a higher value, whereas KC would be a smaller or much uh, more, more or less closer value, okay? So your ET uh, C is a multiplication of this. So it's a function uh, value uh, because ETC is related to ET naught and Kc could be the proportionality constant. So the reference ET0 is defined and calculated using FAO penman monteith equation. As I said, it is a function of multiple um, uh, variables, wind speed, temperature, radiation coming in, radiation going on. It's a very complex equation, which the FAO has done for you. So you can take the ET0 from chapter four, and uh, it, you can estimate ETC uh, by knowing the KC, and the KC is also given to you by FAO. Let's look at some KC values. 
So these are the KC values. And as I said, the plant grows uh, and then the initial period is KC initial. And then the mid range is when the plant almost matures. And then the end is when the plant is dying off or ready for harvest. Okay, so you could see that initial stage the plant doesn't take consume much water, okay, because uh, it is having less uh, area of leaf or other aspects. The KC mid is when it matures, so that is the max. You can see all the max values are in the KC mid, and KC end is when it is ready for harvest, it dies down, etc. So if you look at these uh, for a particular crop height and a particular crop, the FA has given you the data for KC. Let's take cauliflower, carrots. So you have 1.05, 0 0.95. There's no uh, KC initial because it's under the ground and KC uh, mid is there. But uh, for small vegetables like uh, uh, you have your brinjal, etc., you do have some KC values. Okay, eggplant here. So you do have some um, uh, 0 0.6, 1.15, 0 0.8, etc. So from this exercise, you could calculate your KC from the previous ET naught from chapter four, you can take your ET naught and you can estimate your evapotranspiration. Which is, and you can see how it is a very uh, mathematically uh, empirical based model. Okay, so these are the two methods widely used. One is physical method, and then you have your empirical method. On top of that, we also have satellite remote sensing derived products. So satellites which are on the top, we have already. Uh, said that it has been used for measuring precipitation. It can also measure indirectly your evapotranspiration. So they have some um, um, capturing devices, image capturing devices, which are related to your evapotranspiration and amount of water vapor uh, that accumulates in the atmosphere. So you could see here an image taken by NASA MODIS uh, platform. It is open source, anyone can take it and you could use it widely. And many of the Indian data products uh, you can find in this row one also are derived from satellite products. The one issue is uh, the scale. The scale might not be as a small village or even a plot scale. So that is hard to get that values. But for a village or a district boundary, you can still get good ET values uh, from these satellite products. And more importantly, it is open source uh, free to use and cost effective. So uh, these are the multiple methods. So we have discussed today about evaporation, transpiration, what are the process? We've combined them together as evapotranspiration. We've looked at why it is important in the hydrological cycle. We've looked at what are the methods to measure physically and empirical methods. And if these two methods <coughs> are kind of costly and not available readily, you could get into your satellite products. With this, we will conclude the evaporation uh, part of the seminar or lecture. Let's meet in the next lecture.